So I am very, very excited to be introducing you all to my dear friend, Tracy Kimberly, who is a health and life coach in Canberra. Thanks for being here, Trace. Thank you for having me, Tracy. It's a great pleasure. I always love chatting to you. It's Trace and Trace. Oh, I know, I know. You're destined to be together when we're both, uh, yeah, in that, born in the 70s and got that great name. <laughs> Awesome name. Everyone that's Trace is awesome. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Well, I think well, <laughs> well, I'm very glad that you're a part of the summit. Um, you know, I don't, I was thinking I don't, you know, I don't want to spoil what you're going to be talking about in the summit today. So um, a little bit about you, though, just to introduce yourself to everybody listening. Okay. Um, well, as you've said, I'm a health coach here in Canberra. I'm a life coach in training. Um, I'm a mum of four. I have two boys and two girls, so life's um, always exciting. Um, my eldest daughter has type 1 diabetes, so that um, makes life extra exciting. Um, so if you hear any alarms going off, that's her. I've got her CGM right beside me. I carry it, her data with me all the time so I can watch her, which gives me a great peace of mind. Um, yeah, so as I said, I'm a life coach in training, which is really exciting at the moment. And um, with quarantine restrictions just being lifted and the kids going back to school yesterday, I can actually get me underway again. I've kind of in the last two months put me to the side. And I've had to put on my teacher hat, which is not a very comfortable fit. I'm not meant to be a teacher. Um, and I've had to put a lot of my stuff to the side to get through the last few weeks and months. Um, so the last two days have been very exciting about getting back into the groove and studying and yeah, finding me again. So, yeah. It's awesome. Good. Awesome. It's time. It's definitely yes. time. Yeah. <laughs> Um, one of the things I think a lot of people don't really understand is what type 1 diabetes is and how it differs from type 2 because generally people just kind of lump diabetes together but they're all fundamentally very different and you know you've taught me so much around type 1 because I don't really know many people that have it yet it is you know there are a lot of people with it but it is it is severely life-threatening and one of the things that just blows my mind you know with your job you know, with Ash, it's just 24-7 and there's so much unknown around what happens to her. You know, as you said, you've got her monitor with you all the time because you just don't know what could come in um, each day that can affect her, you know, blood sugar levels and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So maybe, because um, I know when she was diagnosed, it's very, it was hugely traumatic and I don't want to, you know, put you through that again. And I will let everyone know that I did talk to Tracy on my podcast. So if you're interested in learning the story around when Ash was diagnosed, I'll put the link below to that so people can go and have a listen. But can you today maybe just share a little bit of information on the difference between type 1 and type 2 and just what, I mean, what is, what is life really like for you with a, a child with type 1 diabetes? Wow. Um, it's very different. It's not at all exactly how I planned my life as a mum to be. Um, so type 1 is an autoimmune condition. Uh, how it comes about in the body um, is still not exactly known. Um, we know there are triggers um, and it's usually it's... The saying goes, all your ducks line up. So um, there's a lot of things that have to sort of line up and then that trigger usually for most people, not everybody, it's an illness that um, weakens or impacts the immune system and then that somehow triggers the body to start attacking the beta cells, which are your insulin secreting um, and making cells in the body. Um, the pancreas uh, does a lot of other functions. Um, so Ashley's pancreas still works. It is only the beta cells that are being attacked. Um, so, yeah, that's, um, which is hard because we all know from type 2 diabetes and eating sugar, what that causes. So for Ashley not having any function in her beta cells, she has no ability in her body to manage um, the sugar 
that either is exogenous or inogenous. So it either comes from within the body, so the liver makes it. We all know that our bodies can make sugar, glucose. Um, we also know that we can eat it. Um, both forms, Ashley's body and any type 1 diabetic, they do not have the processing like we do to um, break it down to use it for energy within their body. Um, so therefore, most type 1 diabetics, when they're diagnosed, they're in a state called DKA, which is diabetes ketoacidosis, which is not ketosis, just to put that very <laughs> out there. Um, it's diabetic ketoacidosis, which means they have high ketones and high glucose levels, and they're basically being poisoned. Um, it's a horrible state to be in. Um, the younger you are generally, tends to happen a lot quicker. Um, I haven't actually found any concrete reason as to why the beta cells will deteriorate a lot quicker in a child than say versus an adolescent into an adult. Hence why most adults when they are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, they have the condition called LADA, late onset. Um, and they're usually diagnosed as a type 2 diabetic before they are diagnosed as a type 1. Um, mm -hmm. so it's very hard to your cells deteriorate a lot slower as an adult. Um, having type 1 diabetes, as I said, um, we all know what type 2 diabetes problems and issues arise, like there's PCOS and um, insulin resistance is usually what some form of insulin resistance is what happens. Uh, that's a type 2 diabetic. So it's both of them, type 1 and type 2, are insulin related. It's just that type 2 diabetics, they still can make and use their own insulin. It just may not be as effective and as efficient. Um, hence why we go low carb or we do some dietary changes and things like that to help their body to rebuild, whereas Ashley, that won't happen. Um, so it makes life very, very challenging. Um, right at the moment, she's 15, so we're right smack bang in the middle of puberty. So when people jokingly say teenagers are driven by hormones, I will totally back that and say it is correct. <laughs> um, I think the, the things you can see and read when you've got a CGM, the data, the, the, the glucose spikes, the, um, the, the patterns that emerge, the, the insulin changes and differences from day to day, from moment to moment, like yesterday, for example, we had perfect levels. We weren't using much insulin yesterday morning, whereas this morning insulin is like water at the moment. She's at 11. Um, maybe she's in maths class. I don't know. So she's a little <laughs> stressed. <laughs> um, but right at the moment she could be right in the middle of her cycle. She could be ovulating, which also causes um, insulin resistance. Um, and so, therefore, you know, I'm – together where her pancreas, I have to work out what's going on. And sometimes I have to take off that, that, that hat of learning of what's happening and just go, this is what's being presented in front of me. What am I going to do? How am I going to troubleshoot this problem but forget about what's causing it? And um, we all like to know what's causing problems. Sometimes with type 1 diabetes, you've just got to go with the flow. Um, and that's why it's so nice to have such a community. I've been building a community around me because it takes a community, I think, with type 1 to really double uh, troubleshoot lots of issues and problems that go on and also to have the support to just say, you know what, Trace, it's just life. She's a human being. Just move through as best as you can. Um, at the moment, she has a HbA1c. If you don't know what that is, that's a three-monthly average of your blood glucose or well, the damage to your red blood cells actually by glucose. Um, and she's 5.2. Um, you're diagnosed as a type 2 diabetic at 6.5. Uh, a healthy person will sit around 4.8, 4.9. Um, and you're still considered healthy up to about 5.5, 5.6. And that's where you'll then be diagnosed as pre-type 2. So Ashley sits with non-diabetic normal bloods. Um, so... We're pretty proud of that. It takes a lot of hard work to get to that. I'm a little bit tired this morning. I've been up since 3.30. Um, we just had a few little highs or stubborn. We weren't really high, but just 
I like to make sure I, I, I tend to get up at 3.30, 4 o'clock, look at the data that's been happening overnight and see how we're tracking and trending and I tend to give a little bit of insulin just to help with dawn phenomenon. So she wakes up with good um, blood levels, otherwise she feels horrible. Um, so there, it's just lots of little things that I do to maintain her health and, and her blood glucose levels because, as I said, I'm, I'm her pancreas. So um, I could keep talking this so much. Um, mm. The day in the life of a type 1 diabetic um, and... You know, for some people, they don't have massive highs in the morning, so they don't have to worry about those those little things. I know that Ashley has a high in the morning. I don't know if that's just because she's um, a teenager, um, whether she's had a good night's sleep. There's lots of other things, but I do know that if I can just get on top of those things in the morning, we tend to have a better day. Um, mm -hmm. And maths class challenges us greatly. <laughs> Okay. Just amazing. I mean, you know, just having a teenager alone is hard. But, you know, I just don't think, really, you know, as I said, I never really realised, like, if you miss this stuff, I mean, and I know you've talked to me about times where just your intuition has sent you into that bedroom at the right time. You know, I don't think people realise that people, you know, people can die. This is life and death stuff. And this is stuff that you are living with every day to keep your beautiful girl alive and I just want people to understand that this is such a, a serious condition it's not type 2 it is you know you know I, I suppose before insulin was actually invented you know able to pump in insulin these people did die you know that's what happened to them so we're really lucky now with that medicine has come this far that we you know are able to you know to keep these people alive now but it is such a serious condition now what i'd love to know is why low carb for, for you and ash and how do you think that has i know you talked about the hba1c but you know how do you think overall that's that's helping and why are you so passionate about doing you know this when really because i know it's against what a normal person yes. would think a type 1 diabetic needs and you fought up river yep. since she was diagnosed to to do this yes because insulin um she's got insulin now so she can eat anything she wants so just let her have whatever she wants and give her insulin um and that was what i was first told when she was diagnosed and at that stage i'd been helping my dad for six months learn about type 2 diabetes so i had an understanding well actually my understanding was insulin was bad and all of a sudden i have a child laying in hospital who needs insulin my world was just so out of control because here's this word insulin where somebody's metabolically sick but then because of no insulin somebody's sick um so when we came home the first three weeks after ashley was diagnosed like i've just explained to you about how there's you know there's puberty there's hormones there's maths class there's um, and, you know, and then you've got the flip side where she might have done some exercise. She's got excitement. So her muscles and things will take up glucose so she doesn't need insulin. So there's such a balancing act. The first three weeks of bringing her home was such a roller coaster. Um, here I'm being told to feed her anything and everything she wants. If she wants carbohydrates, just feed her, just feed her. And I was finding that I was feeding her food that I had never had before because I needed to start giving her carbohydrates because she needed insulin. And then all of a sudden we're giving insulin, but I have to give her more carbohydrates because, oh, my God, she's dropping low and I've got to save her life. And so it just there's this massive roller coaster and it was starting to have a great impact. And I thought, you know, okay, she needs to have insulin. I, I've, I've worked that out. don't still really understand what insulin was at the beginning but I needed something to grab onto. I needed to hold on to something because I was in a whirlwind. I was losing, I was losing control being a mum and, and um, losing control of the family because at that stage, Ashley was 11, so I had a nine-year-old, a seven-year-old and a three-year-old. Um, and so it was, you know, they needed me too. And then all of a sudden we were sitting in a meal and it's like, no, nobody can need me quickly. Ashley's dropping low in the middle of a meal. Quick, quick, quick. And I thought, we can't keep living like this. So I started researching 
into some of the things that I had been helping my father with six months prior to changing because I knew, well, this is sugar, this is glucose, this is um, carbohydrates. My dad was lowering carbohydrates. Could this be a possibility of a way to manage or help support what we're going into and what's happening around here? And it was funny, one night after she was diagnosed, about three weeks after she was diagnosed, we had our meal, everything was pretty good. We sent her to bed. She was at 7 millimole when she went to bed. An hour and a half later, she had dropped to 1.7. That scared every living cell in me. Um, I remember sliding down the wall. I was a mess. After I corrected her, it spent, I spent two hours correcting her. We didn't have CGM, so continuous glucose monitor at that stage. So it was just continuous finger pricking, toe pricking for about two hours just to get her stable. Um, and for me to, to mentally be able to let her go to sleep. Um, and I remember sliding down the wall after I, you know, finished dealing with this, this, this incident. And um, because that, obviously that incident too was an intuition incident. I remember walking past her room and I went, something doesn't feel right. And I said to my husband, I've just got to go test her. And he said, oh, no, no, she's not. We, you know, we've got the alarm set for 1 o'clock. We'll get up at 1 and, and, and test her then and just to make sure. And I said, no, I'm going in to test her. And he said, yeah, all right. And I'm so grateful that I went in and tested her because 1.7, um, that's deadly. On another side, you know, having low blood sugar levels, um, there's seizures. There's the, They could just go into a coma. There's, there's so many other things on the other spectrum having a low blood sugar. Um, and so, yes, the next day I got an email from my father and he said, Trace, you know all the low-carb stuff we've been learning? I found a type 1 diabetic who's living low-carb. And it was a just a sign and a, and a thing of hope. And I thought, yeah, because food to me is really important. Um, I've been an athlete. I suffered from anorexia. And the way I got through good and bad with those things was food. Food, I just knew, was so important for our bodies, our survival, our life. And just finding that this one, <laughs> one diabetic was doing low carb, um, it, it just, I felt several pieces of puzzles just falling into place in a time that I was just losing everything. And um, I went investigating on anything and everything I could find my hands to do with low carb and food. Um, and, you know, it never crossed my mind that not having carbohydrates was going to stunt her growth or she wasn't going to grow properly because in my mind I was like, well, her body can't, her body doesn't do this anymore. If someone had a peanut allergy, would you feed them peanuts and have the EpiPen ready and waiting? You, you, you don't do that. Someone has a fish allergy, you just don't feed them seafood. My child cannot metabolise sugar anymore, so why on this earth would I give it to her? It, it made so much sense to me. Um, mm. But that was that, that was that initial pillar of hope that we found was low carb and we just, we went, we just dove straight into it. Um, so, yeah, no, low carb is, mm. it's just, as I said before, there's so many parameters that change constantly and, and her body's changing and growing. So growth hormone causes um, problems, um, exercise causes other flip side things where, you know, we need to use less insulin. Having one less thing we have to stress about or worry about or not have to count or factor in just is a little bit of happiness, um, yeah. a little bit of sanity in a world that's very chaotic. Um, I'm growing a human here. Um, that's not easy. Yeah. And how she how she handled it all? I mean, you know, I know with my teenage kids, I mean, the typical teenage diet is just disgusting. And, um, you know, we as mums do our best, with the best that we can at home. You know, I've got the luxury if my kids do want to go off to McDonald's with their friends or have some crap with their friends, you know, they can do it, their bodies will handle it. But it's very different with Ash. So how how has she handled all of this? She's amazing. Yeah. She's amazing. Yeah. She really yeah. is. Um, I, I'm very blessed that I have somebody who um, 
she's just so resilient. Um, however, we've, we've had some phases and stages. You know, as much as I want to be really, really strict and keep her bloods, and I could keep them as straight lined and as flat as possible, I sometimes have to allow her to feel within herself and in her body what it's like to be at these levels so she understands what it is we're trying to do. Um, and and I, I guess that's the beauty of low carb, and this is where I, I face challenges with other type 1 diabetics, is they don't actually know how good they can feel by mm. having such stable blood glucose levels. She knows. She knows what it's like to have normal blood sugar levels for hours and hours on end. Um, and, yeah, as I said, I'm just, I, I am very lucky. Um, we've just done a two-month very strict stint of carnivore and she did amazingly well. And when I say strict, I mean very, very strict. We've just started to introduce a few little things, um, like she's just had some mushrooms. Uh, we had some cognac rice last night. Um and she's working out her balance in between carnivore and little extras that she would like to have, feels that she needs to have. So we're getting into a time now where I'm trying to teach her about her body and how she feels, and it's it's difficult because um, mm. I know where I want her to be. I'd love her to be strict carnivore. Um, from all the reading with the water immunes and, and, and things like that that I've done, um, but I, I can't do that. It's her body too. She's coming into mm. learning. Like with all teenagers, we got to let them learn. They have to make mistakes. Mm. However, I do have to talk to her about some of her mistakes could be very detrimental. Um, I have always been extremely honest with her. She knows that she has an illness. Um, I don't believe in hiding that from her. Um she knows the, the, the good side and the bad side um, of what she has. And um, like for the example the other day, we had to have a big chat about gluten because um, she was celiac. And I said to her, you know, with a celiac, there's not much I can do. If, if your stomach and your intestines, they start to break down and they don't work anymore and you're not absorbing nutrients, there's not a great deal I can do but I can still give you insulin. So if you had to choose something because you were out and you were hungry and you had to choose and there was something here with sugar and it was gluten-free or there was something here that had no sugar but it had gluten, which mm. one are you going to choose? Mm. And she said to me, she says, well, I'd choose the gluten-free. I said, good, because I can give you insulin. Not that I believe that insulin is, you know, you just use it willy-nilly. But I have to teach her the things that are happening in her body, what's happening to her. Celiac is just something that has slowly started to come through in her over the last year. Um, she wasn't celiac when she was first diagnosed. So we were three years without um, dealing with that. We now have to deal with that on top of type 1. So, um, you know, I have to teach her how to troubleshoot moments in life because let's face it, if she's out with friends, she may not be able to source a low-carb, gluten-free something to eat. Yeah. Um, and so she needs to understand her body um, and this is a part of her. As I said to her, you know, some people wear glasses, some people have hearing aids, some people have to have a wheelchair, a walking stick. I said, you just have to have insulin. Your pancreas doesn't work. So let's work a way around this. That's... Mm. It's what we've got to do. Um, yeah. So amazing! You're amazing, Trace. I mean, I just this journey is just going to keep going, and you know what you you know how it evolves and what you both learn is just amazing. And you have become a huge support to many people as well who have type one. So can I talk a little bit about? Um, so I'm conscious of the time now. I don't want to talk. I want to let you go, but. Just in court, you know, you mentioned that this was such a lonely journey at the beginning, but you have created a huge support network. So I just want to put that out there for anyone listening who might have type 1 or know someone that does and is, you know, feeling very alone. And, and just to talk a little bit about what are the support networks you've 
created? How can people find them? And maybe um, just a little bit about the doctors that have really been supportive or, and, well, not just doctors, but practitioners that have helped in your journey. Yeah. Um, so I, I talk a lot on my own personal Facebook. I just write things daily um, or whenever I need to, good and bad, about type 1. And I've had many friends reach out to me saying, hey, I've met somebody. Can I put them in contact with you? Um, as I tell everyone, if you've got my phone number and you meet a type 1 diabetic or a newly diagnosed type 1 diabetic family, give them my number. Um, I, I, I will never leave a type 1 diabetic um, alone and I will help find support in their area. I know lots of people through many channels. I, you know, I deal with a lot of people in America. I've got friends in Melbourne. I've got friends in Sunshine Coast. I know people over in Western Australia. Um, as most people know, I'm not shy. I talk to everybody. Um, I know everybody. They just don't know it yet. <laughs> um, and it's it's come from being so alone. When we were first diagnosed, um, I was bullied. I was belittled by many staff at the hospital. Um, I, we also had some great nurses, but many of the specialists, I was bullied because you're just a mum. You don't know anything. And you're not going to be able to deal with this. And that broke my heart because she's my baby. Um, and taking her home was the scariest thing I ever did because once you're at home, you're on your own. Um, and you've got to learn how to this disease, as, I, as you said at the beginning, it's 24-7, 365 days of the year. It doesn't go anywhere. It's a shadow that walks along with you everywhere. You have mm -hmm. to learn how to live life. Um, so I've just recently been asked by Low Carb Down Under to help set up Low Carb Down Under, their type 1 diabetes side. Um, Fantastic, so Trace. I'm very excited. Um, yes. I'll be doing that, yeah, with um, a friend of mine, Tara Whelan. She's a diabetes yeah. educator. She's a type 1 diabetic herself and she's a pharmacist. So she'll bring the science and I'll bring the mummy love. <laughs> So I'm really, Perfect. really excited. Um, so that's that's going to be a really big adventure for us. Um, I also have lots of friends. I mean, at the beginning, one of the things I did was go and talk to people who have type 1. They, they know this life. They've lived it. Um, and I've got a lovely friend that I speak to all the time, Vashti. She's had type 1 diabetes since I think it was 1982. She's almost 50, so she's been through so much to do with type 1 diabetes. And she's now low carb herself, I think, eight years. And when you hear from somebody who has this disease and they say, Trace, I wish I had known about low carb my whole life, you've got to listen to that. This person lives with it. Specialists deal with it. They understand it from a book. But we're not all a book. Well, some parts of us will work like the book. We might do some things like the book, but none of us are exactly the same as the book. <laughs> and so there's so much we can learn from other individuals. And that's why I'm really excited about the type 1 diabetes space that I'll be working with is meeting all these other individuals who thrive in their own special way and just being able to share that with other people. I mean, at the moment um, or end of last year, I was speaking to a mum that a mutual friend got us in contact with. Her 23-month-old daughter was diagnosed with type 1. Um, oh, you know, so that's, that's scary. Yeah, beginning this time last year, we were out to dinner and I was speaking to the mum that was sitting beside me about type 1. Um, she was talking to me about her other son because Ashley and her son were the same age. We were talking about his struggles and difficulties and I was talking because she wanted to understand what I was mathing out for Ashley to have her dinner to give insulin and she was like, oh, my goodness, uh, about four weeks later, her little four-year-old boy was diagnosed with type 1. So um, it's around, it's out there and I just... You know, I've always been told I talk a lot, so I'm just going to keep talking and yeah. the right people hear me. Um, I have a lot of people that stand against me and that's fine um, because the people that I've actually been able to be there and help at 2 o'clock in the morning um, at different stages, you know, that to me, that, that makes me um, 
feel just so much better about this horrible life that we sometimes have to endure, just being able to help and support, you know, people because I've just, I've been there. I know what they're going through, but I also can help. I've helped a few doctors and other people just understand differences with type 1 diabetes because it's a, for doctors and people, it's an icky subject. Type 1 is so confusing, as you know before. There's puberty, there's body systems, there's, there's so many variances with type 1. It's it's a it's a whirlwind to try and understand. So, um yeah, I'm putting my talking abilities into good use these days. <laughs> well, thank God you are. You're an absolute legend. And um, I will, when I put this up down below, I'm going to have all your contact links so people can find you, reach out. And, of course, you are the co-convener, um, co-creator of Low Carb Canberra as well. So if anyone watching lives in and around Canberra, of um, you must connect with Trace and Dr Liz Fraser who run that group as well and I believe are in the process of putting together um, an online low-carb Canberra for the coming up later this year. So God knows, Trace, how you do all this with managing what you manage plus your study plus, you know, all this. But as, you, as we know, you know, this is what life's all about and you're just embracing it. You take it one step at a time. Some days you nail it, some days you don't. I mean, that's just what it's about isn't it when we're a human being but I'm yeah. so grateful to know you I'm so grateful that you're part of the summit and I can't wait to watch what you your presentation thank you darling thank you I'm really touched that you invited me um it was it was a bit of a struggle doing my talk because it was actually about me and that's a very challenging topic I can talk about type one because that's the mummy me and I'm you know that's my daughter <laughs> but when it comes to me yeah so thank you for having me and um, I, I can't wait to see the summit and all the presenters. I know a few of them and um, I'm just so excited. I'm so proud of you. You're just, you're amazing. I'm very proud to be a health coach alongside you. Oh, thank you, darling. Well, go the traces. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're awesome. <laughs> see you soon. Thank Bye, you. darling. Bye. See ya.